Oh, hi, hello there. I'm Liv, I'm back once again with Let's Talk About Myths, baby! This is, of course, the podcast you're currently listening to, and in it, I tell you stories from Greek mythology whilst also pointing out the serious flaws in their plans, and also the way they just fuck everything up all the time. What fun we always have. You may remember from a few episodes back, we started talking about a little thing called the Trojan War. It's pretty famous. You might have heard of it. Last we heard from our intrepid Greeks and Trojans, a whole mess of crap was going down. Remember, Achilles is a strapping young man who's destined to either die in battle or live a long life, but unknown. He was hiding out, pretending to be a girl, when he was taken to the Greeks to partake in the invasion of Troy. At the same time, a super cool guy by the name of Odysseus of Ithaca tried his darndest to avoid war by pretending to be crazy. Poor guy didn't want to leave his wife and brand new baby. But alas, he was unsuccessful. They're both forced to take part. Helen and Clytemnestra are sisters, both embroiled in the mania. Helen has gone off with Paris, a prince of Troy and general troublemaker. Clytemnestra is married to Agamemnon, who is for sure a warmonger and the brother of Helen's husband back in Sparta, Menelaus. Agamemnon is leading the Greeks to war, and because he fucked with Artemis, they were without wind and totally screwed. So Agamemnon sacrificed his own daughter, Iphigenia, because he's a real asshole. And that's where we are. Agamemnon has everyone he needs at Aulis, and now they have wind because he murdered his own daughter, and they're raring to go. This is episode 26, Achilles and Agamemnon, the real housewives of the Trojan War. When we learn of our still intrepid Greeks in Homer's Iliad, nine years have passed since they arrived in Troy. Nine years of constant war, with neither side gaining or losing any ground. The Iliad is, of course, the original source for the Trojan War and one of the first pieces of written literature in classical antiquity. It is, of course, attributed to a man named Homer, but it's been forever debated whether any person named Homer existed or if he actually came up with the story himself. The ancient Greeks passed their stories down orally, so it's very possible that one man heard the story from countless others, and he was simply the first to put it into writing. In any event, the Iliad is an epic poem that was and is centered in the ancient Greek world and its religion. It's one of the two most important stories to their entire culture. The other, of course, being the Odyssey, which is also attributed to Homer and which takes place after the Trojan War. So as I said, the Iliad picks up nine years into the Trojan War. Sing muses of the spat between Achilles and Agamemnon. It revolves around a woman, Chryseis, a daughter of a priest of Apollo, a native of Troy, who, during the war, had been kidnapped by the Greeks. Her father had come to plead with Agamemnon to return his daughter. He offered to pay a ransom, but Agamemnon refused. Chryseis' father had gone to Apollo with this news of Agamemnon's refusal, or rather, he'd gone to Apollo's temple. He asked Apollo to help him. If Apollo ever appreciated any of the worship or offerings he'd received over the many years the father had been a priest. Apollo did appreciate this man, and so he was more than willing to punish the Greeks. For nine days he pummeled them with arrows from above. He was relentless. And so the Greeks found they needed to solve this problem. But how? Achilles, now a mature man who'd been through quite a lot of shit and was very much over Agamemnon's mania, was the first to bring up the issue. He pointed out what everyone knew. They were being punished. They were being killed now by a god and not even the Trojans themselves. If they didn't sort it out now, they were well and truly fucked and would have to return to Greece as losers. They would have to give up the war entirely, and not because they'd been defeated by the Trojans, even. It would be embarrassing, to say the least. So Achilles went to Calchas, their seer, and he asked him what to do. Achilles promised Calchas he would protect him, no matter what the seer conveyed. Particularly, he would protect him from Agamemnon, who Calchas was, rightly, afraid of angering. 
Calchas tells the Greeks that Apollo is punishing them for kidnapping Chryseis against her will. They need to return her without taking the ransom offered by her father. And on top of that, they need to provide Apollo with 100 oxen and goats. Apollo wasn't making it easy, that's for sure. Calchas finishes speaking this, and, well, Agamemnon is not psyched. He's quite peeved, actually. He told Calchas that he had never sided with him. He'd always been trouble, that Calchas was blaming him for all their problems. He told them that all he wanted was to keep Chryseis. It was unfair. You see, he said, he much preferred Chryseis to his own wife, Clytemnestra, who he didn't find neither as exciting nor as talented in the things women are expected to be talented in. He even said that Chryseis was smarter and wittier than Clytemnestra, which I think is a bit of a stretch. Not that Chryseis wasn't likely to be all those things, but I mean, you've kidnapped the girl. How would you possibly have learned that she was smarter and wittier than your wife? Just, you know, seems like he's reaching. Anyway, she was his and he didn't want to give her up just because a god was raining death down on them. Achilles tells Agamemnon that he's being a real dick and they proceed to have a whole epic conversation while referring to kidnapped women as prizes the entire time, which is just awesome. Agamemnon bitches that everyone wants him to give up his prize, and then he'll be the only one who doesn't have a prize. He probably stomped his foot like a petulant child. Agamemnon tells Achilles that the army must give him a new prize, otherwise he'll come and take Achilles' prize, which, spoilers, is also a woman. Achilles threatens to just up and leave. He reminds Agamemnon that he doesn't give a flying fuck whether they defeat the Trojans or not. The Trojans haven't done anything to him. They're only here because of Agamemnon and Menelaus, and doesn't Agamemnon remember that? He's hinting here about Agamemnon's obvious warmonger tendencies. Helen is nearly forgotten. It's not about her anymore. I could make use of a metaphor here from recent history, you know, the last 17 years or so. But I won't. To this insult, Agamemnon goes on a rambly rant about Achilles not being necessary and not being all that good of a warrior anyway. And then he tells Achilles that no matter what, when he's forced to return Chryseis, he'll take Achilles' prize for himself. And like I said, Achilles' prize is also a woman. A woman named Briseis. And Joko thinking Rose Byrne in Troy because there's slim to none chance that Achilles gave any kind of fucks about Briseis. She was the prize. That's what mattered. At this, Achilles is just about to kill Agamemnon himself, but before he can do it, guess who rolls up? Athena. That's right. She shoots down from Mount Olympus, apparently at the urging of Hera, who was concerned for all involved, and she tells Achilles not to kill Agamemnon with his sword. Instead, kill him with words. And he does. The now outdated word BURN! would be an appropriate analysis of the insults Achilles hurls at Agamemnon once Athena leaves. Once Achilles has finished his rant, King Nestor of Pylos comes in to be the voice of reason. He's been around a long time, he tells them, and he's seen a lot of incredible heroes. And then he name drops a bunch of guys I haven't really heard of, so I won't bother trying to explain them to you but we're to assume he's name-dropping big guns in the world of Greek heroes. Not Perseus or Heracles, but you know, nearly as big. No such heroes exist here, he tells Achilles and Agamemnon, basically telling them to check themselves before they wreck themselves. What is the point of fighting between ourselves when we have the Trojans to fight, is essentially the argument he's making. And it's a good one. Seriously. They're here on the beaches of Troy, where they've been for nine years, and they're fighting an unending war with the Trojans. They've been living in tents for nine years, and here they are trying to fight each other? I mean, I understand that being around the same people all day, every day for that long would drive you crazy, but just chill out, guys. You're there to fight the Trojans. Anyway, Nestor tries to chill these dudes out. Agamemnon is basically the boy on the playground who isn't getting the toy he wanted because he counters Nestor's calming statement of the facts with, but Achilles thinks he's better than me. Nestor, I like to assume, rolled his eyes at this nonsense. Achilles responds by making the argument from his end equally petty. 
he says that he doesn't really care about the girl, you know, his prize. That Agamemnon can take her, but that he can't expect to have anything else from Achilles unless he wants to end up on the tip of Achilles' spear. Toxic masculinity, my friends. Now they've finished their pissing contest, Achilles heads back to camp with Patroclus, who I just... God, you guys, the book, The Song of Achilles, is killing me. Achilles. (sighs) And Patroclus. But I digress. They head off, stomping away in anger, and Agamemnon sets in motion the sacrifice of all the animals, as planned, and then Agamemnon himself, well, he sends two of his guys to go to Achilles' tent and take the prize, the girl, Briseis. Achilles, being as emotional as he is badass, complains to his mother about how he's been treated by Agamemnon and the Greeks at large. You see, he's great, but he also knows he's great. He also knows that because he chose to go to Troy, he is destined not to live a long life. And his mom is a goddess, so if anyone can do anything to even the score, it's her. Thetis tells her son that she'll go talk to Zeus about his troubles, see what she can do about it. But she tells him, see, Zeus has actually just left Olympus. He and the other Olympians are off getting some Ethiopian food. Actually, she says they're dining with the Ethiopians, but whatever, still weirdly specific details within this Iliad. Regardless, she tells Achilles that she'll see what she can do when Zeus and the other Olympians are back on Olympus. Odysseus, my main man from Ithaca, was the one entrusted by Agamemnon to sort out the sacrifice of the animals and to return Chryseis to her father so they could get rid of the damn plague that Apollo had placed on them. He did so, returning the girl to her father, and there was a lovely little family reunion. They slaughtered a bunch of animals senselessly, and they were free of the plague. Huzzah! Meanwhile, while most of the Greeks are off celebrating having freed themselves of the plague from Apollo, Achilles is in his tent, not partaking and instead seething in his own anger. He sits out more than just the celebration, too. He doesn't partake in any battles, nothing. He just sits, probably not alone, but with Patroclus, because, well, they were almost definitely a couple. But regardless, he's just hiding out, angry. It was super healthy. And then, on the twelfth day after this nonsense began, Zeus and the other Olympians return to the mountain, and Thetis goes up to chat with old Zeus. She reminds him how awesome her son is, and that he's destined to live a very short life, and because of that, would Zeus pretty please make it so that the Trojans beat the Greeks in battle until they finally respect Achilles appropriately and give him back his prize, (coughs) female human being? Now, Zeus wasn't so sure about this proposition. He hummed and hawed a bit, and then he told Thetis, you know, he really wanted to do this, but it would cause a lot of trouble in his marriage, you know, because he didn't do that enough on his own. You see, he said, Hera already claimed that he favors the Trojan over the Greeks, so it would make it seem really obviously true if he went and made it so that the Trojans were winning. But, you know, he told Thetis... I'll do it for you because you do make a very good point that your son is being disrespected because the other Greeks took away his well-won prize, even if that prize is a female human being. In the end, he tells Thetis, I'll make it happen. So Thetis leaves. She's happy. She's won. But then Zeus immediately has Hera to contend with. Hera basically calls him out for exactly what just happened. She says, hey, what are you up to? Are you planning to side with the Trojans in order to punish the Greeks that are being mean to Achilles? Zeus, in response, gaslights her so hard he basically invented it right here and now. He tells her, no, what are you talking about? So she clarifies. She says, well, I just saw Thetis here, and she was grasping your knees, clearly asking you for a favor, and you nodded your head, which means you agreed to that favor. And since Thetis is Achilles' mom, I know that what she wanted from you was for you to cause the Trojans to start killing the Greeks like crazy so that they learn that they need Achilles and he feels respected again. Like, Hera tells him exactly what happened, 
down to the craziest details. And Zeus keeps going with his gaslighting. He tells Hera, seriously, I don't know what you're talking about. You always want to start trouble and you never trust me. You're always getting suspicious about everything. And you know the only thing you get out of that is to distance us. And you know, I don't have to tell you all my plans. Sure, you're my wife. And so if I want to tell you a plan, then I'll tell you a plan. But I don't have to. And anyway, I don't know what you're talking about because there's no such plan right now. Seriously, you might as well use this moment as the definition for gaslighting a woman. Because obviously Hera is completely right. And for that matter, Zeus, maybe she's always suspicious because you're literally always cheating on her. You're always giving her reasons to be suspicious. And aside from that, entirely, she's totally goddamn right. Night came, and as everyone was sleeping soundly, Zeus put together a dream. He sent the dream into the Greeks' camp on the beaches of Troy and into Agamemnon's head. The dream told him that now was the time to arm all the Greeks and attack the Trojans. It told him that Hera had swayed the minds of the gods and that all the gods were now on the side of the Greeks. Now was the time that they could finally defeat Troy. When Agamemnon woke up, the dream was fresh in his mind. He went straight out and assembled the Greeks. He got together all his commanders and he told them about this dream. Actually, Homer could have used an editor around now because between Zeus summoning the dream, the dream traveling to Agamemnon, and the dream being relayed by Agamemnon to his commanders, the exact same lines are repeated word for word. Seriously, just skimmed to that point. Repetitive, Homer. My god. Agamemnon told his commanders about his dream, and Nestor stood up and told the commanders that, of course, if any other person had relayed a dream like this, they would have called him a liar. But no, not Agamemnon. Clearly, this was the right decision. Because no one questioned the motives for the gods carrying down this dream, just the man they gave it to, and he checked out. It was decided among the commanders, and so they called together all the rest of the Greeks. Agamemnon stood in front of all of them holding a staff made by Hephaestus. I tell you this tiny, seemingly useless detail because Homer thinks it was a big deal. He follows the statement that Agamemnon was holding this staff by explaining that it was made by Hephaestus for Zeus. Zeus gave it to Hermes. Hermes gave it to Pelops, who gave it to his son Atreus, who on his deathbed gave it to his brother Thyestes, who gave it to Agamemnon. And now we're done with the staff. It's fancy, is the point. But Agamemnon didn't tell them the plan he had just decided with the commanders. Instead, he told them that Zeus had betrayed them, telling Agamemnon so many years ago that he would be successful here. So, he said, sad as it is that they will leave having not defeated the Trojans, they will put their ships back in the sea and sail home. Something's afoot. The excitement of the Greeks at this news, that they would be sailing home after nine years of a pointless war, wafted up to Mount Olympus and worried Hera. She went to Athena and told her to go down to the army and talk them out of leaving. Athena goes straight to Odysseus and whispers in his ear, How could he consider leaving after all of this? Not only would the whole nine years be in vain, but do they really want to return home having accomplished nothing? The Trojans would know they won, that they would get to keep Helen with no repercussions at all. Odysseus totally agrees, and he knows it's Athena who's come down to tell him. And so he runs off to convince the others. And, fine, he runs straight to Agamemnon, and he takes Agamemnon's staff, so I guess the fancy staff comes back into the picture. And Odysseus goes to each and every Greek preparing to leave and either convinces them nicely that this isn't the time to leave and that they must stay and finish what they started. He tells them that what they don't know is that Agamemnon is really testing them and right now they're failing. Or if they were being stubborn about coming around to this development, he beats them with the staff and calls them nobodies until they too agree to stay. This was, of course, kind of what Agamemnon intended by telling the Greeks they could leave. He was testing them, and they failed. 
And he did too, really, because this was definitely not his plan. He wasn't really planning on Odysseus racing around telling them that they were being tested, but there you go. Odysseus saved the day for Agamemnon. He convinced the Greeks that they couldn't leave yet. They had to finish what they started. Plus, if they really did leave, they would have officially failed Agamemnon's test, and they'd all be fucked because that dude does not take disappointment well. Agamemnon and the other commanders assembled all the men together now that they knew the truth, that they were not going home. And they all sat and listened, except one man, Thersites. We're told Thersites is very ugly for a myriad of reasons that I won't bore you with now, but he's ugly, and he's hated by Achilles and Odysseus, even though we're not told of a reason beyond he's kind of gross to look at. Anyway, Thersites is not psyched that they're staying. He rages at Agamemnon and Achilles as everyone looks on. He's mainly angry at Agamemnon for his decisions over these nine years. He tells the crowd how Agamemnon has kept all the gold they've plundered for himself, how he's kept so many women and had the Greeks kidnap so many more sons of Trojans. He basically voices every complaint possible. And then he turns on Achilles, saying that Achilles is basically just giving in to the whims of Agamemnon. Now this is in front of everyone, so everyone is watching this unfold, and I mean a lot is unfolding. This dude is making a real scene. Odysseus puts a stop to it, calling the dude out for being a real dick, and I mean, he defends Agamemnon a lot, probably more than is warranted. But Odysseus is a smart dude. That's kind of his thing. He knows how to survive and just how much to kiss Agamemnon's ass. So he threatens Thersites in a bunch of violent ways and then hits him super hard on the back with that staff. Again, with the fancy staff. But this works. His threats and violence distract the Greeks who really like that stuff and also really dislike Thersites, I guess because they all forget about how they really did want to go home. And now they're all, oh, Odysseus, he's so crazy. He's got their attention now. So Odysseus stands up in front of everyone, still holding the fancy staff, and he gives a rousing speech. He reminds the Greeks assembled there what they had gone through, and hasn't Agamemnon commanded us well? Haven't we come so far and gone through so much? Sure. You miss home. It's been nine years. But recall the prophecy made shortly after we arrived, he tells them, when Zeus sent a snake to eat a mama bird and its eight babies. Okay, I mean, he didn't say mama bird, but seriously, what a sad prophecy. Anyway, remember when we watched a snake devour those nine birds, and then our seer Calchas foresaw through this that we would fight the Trojan War for nine years, but in the tenth year we would win— beating the Trojans and seizing their city and all its riches. He reminded the men that they need to be patient. And subtly, he reminded them that he, Odysseus, is really the badass of the group. Well, friends, we'll leave it there for now. I won't even say there it begins because with the Iliad, you're really thrown right into the action. You can't see, but in my script, the word action is in quotations because, I mean, that's not a lot of action, Homer. So since we're talking Achilles, I have to give a shout out to this book. The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller is an incredibly well-researched novel about Patroclus and Achilles through childhood and into the Trojan War. Like I mentioned earlier, Patroclus and Achilles were acknowledged to be best friends and companions in the mythology, but it's not an insane place to jump to to suggest that they were, in fact, partners who couldn't officially be so. In fact, it's fairly widely acknowledged that Achilles and Patroclus were most likely gay and that they were together. They're referred to as each other's beloveds, like, often? More evidence of this will arise as I continue into the war, but for now, I'm just telling you about this fucking book. That's the premise of the book, their relationship from well before the war. And the book is so fucking goddamn beautiful. I can't even say that enough. I've seen it everywhere since it came out and I bought it ages ago and only just recently finally cracked it open. And my God, I'm so glad I did. 
Also, because she has a new book called Circe, which I assume is going to be about Circe and probably Odysseus, but I'm making a point not to look into it. I'm just going to buy it the moment it comes out. But The Song of Achilles, I just, I can't recommend it enough. I haven't been so enthralled and unable to put a book down like that in ages. You know, when you read a book and your heart just aches for the characters, you can't wait to keep following them, but you also don't want it to end. That's me reading this book to the point where, honestly, I read like half of it in a day and then had to stop. And well, I didn't pick it up again for a few weeks because the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus is so beautiful and so engrossing that I I don't want to keep reading it because, well, I know how it ends. I don't know where the book ends in terms of the war, but I know how it ends for Patroclus and Achilles and I don't want that for these versions of them. These magnificent characters with depth and emotion and so much love. I foresee many tears when I finally find the courage to finish the book. Anyway, I could go on, obviously, but I won't. Just know that you should read it, like, now. And also know that my newfound love for the characters of Achilles and Patroclus and their relationship is definitely going to influence my telling. Like, even earlier when I said Achilles doesn't care for Briseis. In the book, he cares about Briseis, so I just don't know anymore, you guys. Anyway, I'm going to try to keep it, you know sticking to the Iliad and not developing into an obsession with this book. And with a very extensive rant, I leave you. Thank you so much for listening, all you magnificent people. Just an update that you can now find this podcast like everywhere, everywhere, figuratively, literally everywhere. iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, and more that sometimes pop up when I Google myself and didn't even know that those platforms existed. As a reminder, it's always much appreciated if you would rate and review me on iTunes or wherever it is you listen. I mean, do that if you liked the show. If you didn't and you hate me because I talk about lady problems, then you can feel free to quietly complain to yourself in a dark room. Wow, I got weird there. Anyway, thanks everyone. You are truly the best. I'm so lucky to have such lovely fans. I'm Liv. I fucking love this shit.